Okay, good morning and welcome back everyone to our Tuesday morning market outlook session. My name is Tony Zhang. I'm the chief strategist here at Options Play. And welcome back to our sessions that we're resuming again. I'm really looking forward to continuing our sessions Tuesday mornings to help you navigate the broader markets because we have seen a substantial shift here over the past week or so with respect to equity markets finding a bit of a divergence here. Uh, largely, equity markets have pretty much traded in lockstep with each other since April of last year starting to see a little bit of divergence, starting to see a little bit of bifurcation here. And the question is, is that bifurcation gonna continue? Does that mean anything in terms of seeing this bifurcation? And how do we uh, plan for this going forward in terms of our outlook? So that's what I wanna discuss here today. Before we do, what we're gonna discuss is purely for education and demonstration purposes. It is not a solicitation or recommendation to buy or sell any specific securities. So I'll start off with our broader market update, taking a look at the major indices. Like I said, there's some bifurcation here. We wanna identify that bifurcation, understand how that's gonna play out. We'll take a look at sector rotation. We'll take a look at value versus growth. We'll take a look at sector rotation. We'll take a look at specific sectors that are showing some weakness here. And then we'll take a look at the full fixed income spectrum, what that may mean for us in terms of yields and rates and how that affects equity valuations, how that affects our commodities. And then we'll take a look at some of the updates from the labor markets before we share with you some of our ideas based on everything that we're discussing here today. But the primary question that I wanna help investors answer is a question that we've been receiving here a lot over the past couple of days, which is, can we expect further market weakness or is the pullback that we're currently seeing in the equity markets a buying opportunity? So my name is Tony Zhang. I'm the chief strategist here at Options Play. And I wanna share with you my technical charts, my economic research, my statistical research that helps inform my decisions in the broader markets based on the things that we're gonna discuss here today. So if we start with the S&P 500, we continue to talk about this very strong uptrend that we see here on the weekly chart. If we zoom into the daily chart, we start to see some levels of exhaustion where we push higher highs in price, but as you can see, momentum's no longer confirming that high and is actually making a lower high. This type of divergence typically shows us that there's a higher probability of a pullback here. And, and largely what we have here is a bit of a double top here, if you wanna call it that in terms of SPY, that certainly has spent quite a bit of time here pretty much since late March above the 21 day moving average and has not fallen below that level here. So today and perhaps over the next few trading sessions, we may see this move down below the 21 day moving average only below those levels would we consider thinking about looking for buying opportunities. As long as we remain above that level, I think I'm more inclined to be taking profits and looking potentially even for shorting opportunities. But when we look at the NASDAQ 100 index, this is that bifurcation I'm talking about. We have this double top here form on the NASDAQ 100, which largely coincides with the February, late February, mid February highs. And we've now started to turn to the downside here. Now to the downside, you have support, support roughly around the 320 level, but some may, a bigger support here around the 310 level. So as we look at tech names that are starting to get weaker and weaker, uh, and part of a lot of the, 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 the shorts that I've been taking here over the past few weeks have been based on, has been only been in the tech name, uh, this leads me to believe that there are there is potentially some further downside here in the higher beta tech names. And we'll even drill down into specifics that may show even further weakness than the NASDAQ 100 index, which is still a fairly broad based index. If you look at the IWM small caps, after a very strong move here to the upside from, from November, we've been doing nothing except for consolidating here over the past three months or so. And we're still just right smack in the middle of that consolidation range. There's not a whole lot out of directional view here. Uh, you wanna call it perhaps a triangle or a rectangle right now looking like it's targeting the bottom of that triangle or a, a rectangle. And the question is whether we see a break below that level, which would uh, suggest further downside, or if we simply bounce off this level and continue this range bound level here. So this is really some of the major indices trading near 
some major support levels that we really have to pay attention to that's going to help us answer that question if this is a buying opportunity or if there is further weakness here in the broader markets. The one I would say um, bright spot in the broader markets is RSP, which is the equal weight S&P 500 index. So far looking fairly resilient and fairly strong. This is showing us that the weakness is coming largely from the mega cap names. And it's actually the smaller cap, the broad based S&P 500 index that actually remains fairly strong. The outperformance of the market is coming from the smaller segment or the smaller spectrum of the S&P 500 names. And this is interesting because this is the, the, the bifurcation and the weakness that we're starting to see. The S&P 500 performing actually quite well and doing, uh, showing quite a bit of resiliency while the, the higher beta tech names showing quite a bit of weakness here. And it's not just tech names. We're also seeing it in some of the travel stocks, some of the reopening stocks. You know, these are all parts of the market right now that are seeing some, some, some um, losing some ground here. But the big, the big theme that still remains, and for those of you that have followed me for a while, here is value versus growth. We've talked about how value has underperformed growth for many, many years. For, but for the past 10 months or so, value has put in this bottoming formation and has started to break out higher here. And what's really amazing is to see is that the breakout here came back to retest this level as support and is now bouncing higher. This is a zoomed in chart here of that breakout level. This is where value started to outperform growth here in mid-February came back to retest this level literally to the penny in early April and has only started to and has only continued to outperform here growth here. This confirms this bottoming formation here of value to growth. This really suggests that value will continue to outperform growth going forward. So especially as you're looking for opportunities here in the broader markets and you're thinking to yourself, all of these tech names that have sold off, uh, you know, the, the, bet, the best performing stocks late last year, are these buying opportunities for these stocks or is it time to reposition? And from my perspective, looking at these charts, it suggests that this is not a buying opportunity for these tech stocks. It's more of a time to rotate into value, rotate into smaller cap um, as we start to see the performance of these sectors outperform the higher beta tech names. And we look at sector rotation here, look at the stocks, uh, look at the sectors that are outperforming, financials, materials, industrials, energy. These are not what I would consider high beta tech names, right? These are not the stocks that are performing. The higher beta tech names, technology, uh, consumer discretionary, uh, healthcare, real estate, all either weakening or getting back into the lagging category. And and then the leading categories or the improving categories are consumer staples, consumer, as you can see, communications attempted to get into the leading category, but is starting to fail a little bit there. And then you have healthcare, real estate also going into the weakening category. Utilities starting to come a little bit to life here, but still in the lagging category here. So as you're looking for opportunities, Remember to continue to looking at names like financials, materials, industrials. That's where I would pay attention to consumer staples. Very strong sector coming up into the leading category. Energy has led quite a bit here. So I would be a little weary to see if this starts to come down as well. So be careful. Energy's strong outperformance is certainly um, interesting to pay attention to, uh, but I'm not sure how much longer that can last. So, and then if we look at, you know, if we dive down even further within the sector rotation, uh, you know, when you specifically look at the very high beta, unprofitable names, largely in this uh, ARC ETF, the one thing I will point out here is ARC recently broke below the 200 day moving average and also broke below this double bottom uh, support here around 110 or what you would consider a triple bottom 110 here. This certainly puts uh, ARC substantially in a weaker spot and likely to retest this $90 support level here to the downside. So when you ask, you know, is it time to buy these higher beta tech names? I think there's a little bit more downside here to some of those names than a buying opportunity just yet. And some of that evidence and some of that view, some of, some of that view is extrapolated from uh, our views on interest rates. So this is the 10 year yield. We haven't talked a lot about the 10 year yield recently because after having such a strong move here in February to April, 
it largely has consolidated here over the past couple of uh, past month or so, month and a half. So it hasn't had a squeeze on valuations like we first saw back in February. But as you can see, it has found some support here around this 155, 160 basis point level, finding some support and potentially now uh, ready to rise a little higher here to that 170, 175 basis point level. And this is not just based on tech because usually we don't apply a lot of technicals to interest rates. Interest rates are usually driven by more monetary and more economic policies. Uh, but the one thing that we can uh, you know, likely are fixed income bonds. So when we look at TLT, so TLT has underperformed significantly over this past year in terms of treasuries. And, and this is generally speaking a good thing from an economics perspective because when you see uh, treasuries sell off, that means that uh, investors are, are ready to take on risk. They're going to sell off risk, riskless assets like treasuries and buy riskier assets assets. Um, however, this also has some concerns around interest rates. So we've had this, uh, you know, sell off here in TLT that accelerated back in, into um, mid-April or mid-March. We've now had a period of consolidation here or what you would call a flag or pendant formation. And we're starting to potentially retest this level here to the downside. Now, if we start to see a breakout here to the downside, that would project a fairly sizable move here to the downside from a continuation pattern perspective. Because you basically had a move from about 154, 155 down to the 137 level here or so. So you're talking about a fairly sizable move and we would use that to project moves here to the downside. And remember, bonds are inverted to yield. So if you have a significant sell-off in bonds, that's going to rise. Um, that's going to have a significant rise in yields. And we're not seeing this just from treasuries. We're seeing the same thing from LQD, which is investment grade uh, bonds. We've had a sell-off here in investment grade bonds, a long period of, I would say, consolidation or continuation, and then a potential breakdown here. Now, the one thing I will say is that these uh, fixed income products have not broken down yet, but this is one to pay attention to because if you do see that breakdown, that's likely going to cause a significant rise in yields, and that is likely going to put further compression on these higher beta, non-profitable st tech stocks, um, in consumer discretionary stocks, any type of stocks, even even some of the uh, the airlines and the and the hotels reopening trades that are trading at what I would consider very, very rich valuations compared to where they were trading prior to the pandemic, literally price to perfection, if you will. Those are the names that you're going to see some downside as yields continue to rise. And high yield, this is the furthest, riskiest uh, side of the spectrum when it comes to fixed income, also failing to break out to new all-time highs uh, after um, you know the move here to the downside. This is losing quite a bit of momentum here as a high yield is still the best performing out of the bonds, bonds but starting to lose some, some of that momentum here and potentially starting to shift uh, some of that momentum here to the downside, which again, when we see this shift across all three risk spectrums, that's a concern here for me. Now, when we look at GLD, GLD is now reaching what I would consider a fairly sizable resistance level. However, you want to take a look at it, you have the 200-day moving average, and then you have this bearish trend line coming in. So GLD remains in the strong downtrend here if we look at this on a daily chart or if you want to look at this on a weekly chart, however you want to draw this. This could be interpreted a few different ways. Uh, if you see this as a continuation of this downtrend, this is a potential shorting opportunity, but you could also view this as a long-term bullish trend here for gold, a period of consolidation or rest, and now it's going to continue moving higher here. Regardless, we're at a pretty pivotal moment here. Uh, and this is the 172, 173 resistance level here around the 200-day moving average. As you can see, the 200-day has pretty much been flat. And the question is whether gold breaks out higher here or not. Um, with inflation expectations, it's very possible that we do see that breakout here in gold. And if that's the case, I would target this 182 and a half uh, highs here to the upside. Um, as a potential move here to the upside. So after uh, forming this bottoming formation here on gold, potentially breaking out higher here, which would, which would um, line up with the rise in yields. So when we 
take a look at the economic side of things. This is really where, uh, you know, the April number surprised substantially here to the downside. Uh, survey what expectations was non-farm payroll to add about a million jobs came in at a, a very, very uh, uh, weak number in comparison to that, only adding 266,000 jobs. The only bright spot out of that entire jobs report is that most of the hiring came out of leisure and hospitality. This is the one part of the market that has been very weak with, with respect to uh, wages and, and respect to um, employment. So seeing gains here in this specific segment of the market or sector of the market is relatively um, a, a positive and speaks to the, the the shape of the economic recovery, if you will. But pretty much all around, this was a very, very weak uh, jobs report for April. And, and it speaks to the stubbornness of the unemployment rate that we're starting to see or the lack of, of um, you know, the bifurcation that we're starting to see between applications and job openings. There's a huge gap right now between available jobs and people applying for those jobs. This is causing labor inflation, substantial labor inflation across manufacturing services and quite a few other industries. This is leading to higher labor costs. This is high, leading to, and, and when you put that in conjunction with higher raw material costs, this is going to put a substantial uh, pot a potential catalyst, if you will, for inflationary concerns. We've seen an 800% increase in S&P 500 companies uh, concern about inflation during their earnings calls. That we've never seen anything like this over the past two decades in terms of S&P 500 companies' concern about inflation. And it's not just uh, uh, you know one-sided; it's labor and uh, raw material goods. So this will likely show up in inflation numbers. This will likely trickle down into consumer goods in terms of the price that we have to pay for consumer goods. And this is going to have some effects on quite a few different industries, whether we're talking about consumer discretionary, consumer staple names, where they are very sensitive to labor and price uh, inflation, or, uh, you know, industrial companies that specialize in automation. When you have strong moves in, in labor costs, that usually is a, a driver of automation and driver of, of moving away from, uh, you know, um, labor intensive uh, sectors. So, these are things that we really have to pay attention to because this is one very strong risk, in my opinion, to the rally that we see in equities right now. And I think markets are already pricing that in based on the weakness that we've seen in the broader markets. So when we look at uh, the services PMI, this is really, again, one of the sex sectors of the markets that we need to see strength here. And both market and the ISM services PMI so far continuing to surprise to the upside. ISM a little weaker than the market numbers, but largely we're seeing gains here from the services side of the, of, of the, um, of the economy. And that, again, is the bare minimum that we need to keep this rally afloat is seeing both manufacturing and services continue to rebound. So far, services coming in okay, but again, further weakness here in this specific part of the market, especially if we start to see a weakness on manufacturing, that is the major risk that I see here with the current equity rally that we have. So when we look at opportunities here in the broader markets, we really, you know, again, we've seen this bifurcation in here in the market. So we have to also look for bifurcated opportunities here as well. So Parker Hannafin is an interesting name in the industrial space because they specifically deal with manufacturing and automation and this is one part of the market that is still remaining very strong, especially with inflation expectations being so strong here. Uh, companies are likely going to invest in automation and manufacturing over the labor costs. They're finding it more and more difficult to hire workers. So what, what are they going to do? They're forced to put, you know, move to automation. And then you combine that with the, um, you combine that with the fact that the global supply chain has been largely disrupted due to COVID, and you have a lot of U.S. companies moving manufacturing back on shore. So companies like Rockwell Automation and Parker Hannafin are the ones that are likely going to benefit from that because they produce a lot of the manufacturing uh, um, machinery, if you will, to, to produce that. So uh, Rockwell Automation, Parker Hannafin, these are some of my top picks with respect to the surge that we've seen in terms of industrial stocks. 
and staple stocks as well, Procter & Gamble. Procter & Gamble recently, uh, similar to Parker Hannafin, recently uh, showing quite a bit of strength here. Uh, had a bit of a, da a, a downturn, but as you can see, broke that downtrend here, came back to retest this level of support and has a potential breakout here to the upside. Looking at Procter & Gamble in the staple space, so as I was showing you on that sector rotation, staples, one of the sectors showing quite a bit of strength here. And then on the flip side, looking for a weakness within those higher beta names. You know, we've been talking about ch chip shortages for quite some time, but we're seeing quite a weakness starting to see, we're starting to see quite a bit of weakness from many of the chip manufacturers. Um, whether this is due to chip shortages, I, I, I doubt that it's actually due to chip shortages, but that's certainly one of the things that it's pressuring some of these chip stocks. But also, I think there's also some concerns now about just the amount of capacity that's trying, that chip manufacturers are trying to add that is likely going to actually create too much supply versus the amount of demand we expect here over the next couple of years because there has been major, major investments in terms of um, capacity for chips over the past six months or so, through, uh, many of them coming out in the past couple of months. So there's some concern that basically we're going to start producing more chips than we can actually uh, produ uh, we can actually consume. So we're starting to see a bit of weakness from many of the chip stocks. Micron, uh, you know, one of the things about Micron is that we're seeing a fairly strong amount of exhaustion. As you can see, higher highs in price pretty much since the $72 level has been uh, con has been. Um, uh, shown with higher and higher degrees of exhaustion or divergence as you have higher highs in price, lower highs in momentum. And now we have a breakdown below some support levels here around this 82, 80, 82 and a half level here. And this would target, in my opinion, down to this $70 level, which corresponds with the 200 day moving average. So when you look at some of these names like Micron, uh, starting to see fair a bit of weakness, and we're seeing this across the board with respect to chip manufacturers and some of of the foundry type companies. And lastly, another segment of the market in consumer discretionary that is again also priced a bit to perfection is some of these hotel and casino stocks. Uh, MGM, uh, we've already seen um, some, some downside here for, for names that have reported like Marriott, but we've also seen a fair amount of margin compression, sorry, uh, multiple compression from gaming stocks like DraftKings, Penn National, uh, these types of stocks that were trading at very, very rich valuations are starting to come in. So MGM kind of sits at the intersection of both of these sections where you have hotel operators as well as online gaming with respect to sports betting. Seeing some multiple contraction here. This is the same negative divergence that we've seen here in uh, some of the tech names here as higher highs in price are combined with lower highs in momentum. And this potentially puts uh, some downside pressure here in some of these names down to this in MGM in, in MGM's case down to about $32 here to the downside. So quite a bit of opportunity both on the upside and to the downside. I will say this particular quarter, we've seen a substantial shift where most of that opportunity is to the downside, whether many of them coming from tech names, specifically higher beta tech names that are not profitable and not growing very strongly. Uh, think about fast, Fastly, Etsy, um, Palantir, Netflix, Intel, these types of names that trade at relatively rich valuations that are not growing very fast, are not very profitable. Those are some of the names that we've seen the most downside. So keep your eyes out on this particular market. I do think that there's more downside for many of these higher beta tech names. There's limited names that still have some upside in the industrial, in the, in the consumer staple space, but there's certainly been a shift here in the broader markets and make sure that you position yourself correctly for this shift. So with that, thank you so much. I hope that this helps you uh, give you some insights into how I'm viewing the markets and how I'm positioning within this particular market. And I hope that uh, I'll see you guys here next week. Thank you so much and have a great trading day.